<laughs> Indeed. So let's let's move on to seri- very serious matters now. And my first story. And uh, one of our, our viewers did comment um, recently in recent days about a story that's been bubbling away here in the UK for uh, quite some time about Sick Youth UK. And uh, yeah, we've had um, a very, oh, I mean, where where to even begin with this story? We have an English phrase uh, to open a can of worms, which basically means you peel back the layers and you find uh, an absolute horror story beneath. And this is very much the case of of this story. It is very much linked into the story of Jagtar Singh Johal. Um, who, of course, we talk about on a regular basis. And I'm very actually pleased to say that on Monday next week, I will be interviewing Jagtar Singh Johal's brother, Gurpreet, uh, who has been campaigning vigorously and very actively over this uh, absolutely appalling, outrageous story of Jagtar, of Jaggi, being, uh, being arbitrarily detained in India for his activities and highlighting India's misbehaviour, to put it uh, mildly. And uh, yeah, so Jaggy's story is very much linked to actually what's been going on here in the UK and uh, linked to the Sick Youth Federation here in the UK. So there's been a story, and it's very timely actually, there's there's been a story just uh, released on Baz News, um, and it's written by Shamsha Singh, who's based in Southall here in the UK. He is actually a co-founder of the National Sick Youth Federation. And he is himself quite an influential Sikh activist, and his work, of course, centres around the Sikh community and Khalistan. Now, various Sikh organisations and a number of Gurdwara committees of England have issued very public statements supporting this organisation, the Sikh Youth UK, and its uh, founder, uh, Deepa Singh. And these two organisations, sorry, this organisation and particularly Deepa Singh have faced a heck of a lot of issues with the British state, West Midlands Police uh, particularly, and particularly their counter-terrorism unit, um, the, uh, the CTU as it's known. And uh, the CTU of West Midlands Police have had quite a vendetta against Sick Youth UK and uh, particularly around this whole charitable funds issue. And um, so in response to this, Shamsha Singh has, has written a very long and very detailed article about what's actually been going on. And unfortunately, we don't have time to go through it in detail, but I have cherry picked, as I tend to do, some of the key points raised by Shamsha in this article. And I talk about a can of worms and wow, I mean, where to begin, where to even begin with this? So unfortunately, under the restrictions of time, I can only pick out a few of these and just point to several issues that uh, that he's raised in this article. And uh, I'll, just, as I say, I'll just quickly uh, flick through this um, and, and highlight uh, some of the quite astounding um, revelations that he comes out with, things that I, I even after in my own research, I wasn't even aware of. And he says that the the UK has a long history of targeting sick activists, which has intensified in the last few years as the government employs creative state sanctioned methods of surveillance and criminalisation. And most recently, uh, SYUK was placed on trial as a result of this CTU, um, arguing that the organisation was misleading the Charities Commission. However, Sick Youth UK was not a registered charity, yet it is being treated, audited and criminalised as one. So even the very premise of what uh, the, uh, the, the CTU have been up to is actually flawed from the very beginning. And it, is, it stands as a warning. What's been going on is a warning to all grassroots, community, religious and other pantheic organisations about the mechanisms and strategies being deployed against sick activists. And again, I, we've talked regularly about uh, the British state and why on earth it has been so uh, almost obsessed to target the Sikh community here in, in the UK and particularly the Khalistan activist community. Why is this friction? Why are they so obsessed with criminalising the, uh, particularly the, the, the Khalistan activists here in the UK? And I have actually raised this very question uh, and I've really struggled to answer Uh, the questions but the evidence is there and it's out there and and this article points to very much it and uh, Shamsha goes back to um, a lot of the history and he says we must contextualize what's been going on with the eight years of collusion and intelligence exchange between the Indian and UK governments and he then immediately refers to the Jaggi case and the failed extradition of what he calls the West Midlands 3. Now this West Midlands 3 uh, comes back to a, a time back in uh, between 2016 and tw- uh, October 2017. There was a series of assassinations of high ranking right wing Hindutva figures in the Punjab. Uh, and nine individuals were assassinated. And this kicked off a, a, a quite an important sequence of events. Now, as a result of these assassinations, India 
would claim that there was an international conspiracy to revive Sikh militancy in the Punjab. India alleged that resources, support and coordination for these assassinations came from here in the UK. Now, uh, subsequent to that, in November 2017, as we've reported, Jaitar Singh Johal was arrested and he was charged with multiple cases relating to what the Indian media would come to refer as a wave of targeted killings in Punjab. So they've linked Jaggi to these killings, as it turns out. He actually wasn't even in, in the Punjab at the time. Uh, Jagtar's uh, charges were twofold. Firstly, radicalising Sikhs, and secondly, conspiracy to commit assassinations. The Indian security establishment needed to show strength following this, uh, this sequence of our audacious assassinations of leading Hindu figures. It was, of course, very embarrassing for India that, uh, that this had happened. India made more arrests and would pin the assassinations on the Khalistan Liberation Force, the KLF. India used the target killings to push their domestic security rhetoric of Khalistani terrorism. Here we go, it suddenly rebounds in the form of uh, this label of Khalistani terrorists. And uh, into it, they, they form this, evolved this, uh, this labeling of Khalistani terrorists into their own foreign policy initiatives that could then be used to target Sikh activists within India's borders and beyond, hence the transnational repression. Uh, India regarded all Sikhs subsequently and all Sikh activism and support for Khalistan, peaceful or not, as terrorism. In 2018, the homes of five Sikh activists were raided by West Midlands Police, the CTU, uh, acting on information from India. The 2018 raids were directly linked to the ongoing arbitrary detention of Jaggi, as all five Sikhs were actively involved in the Free Jaggi Now campaign. In September, West Midlands Police um, uh, publicly tweeted that the raids were to investigate, quote, allegations of extremist activity in India and fraud offences, uh, which they would claim uh, was linked to money laundering to support terrorism in Punjab. Following the raids, a surprise, surprise, the Hindustan Times published, one, the Indian establishment was upbeat over anti-terror raids, Two, the raids were an outcome of diplomatic pressure created by the Indian agencies on Britain about the involvement of those living in the country in anti-India terror activities. And thirdly, the National Investigation Agency, NIA, and the Punjab police have decided to make fresh, a fresh bid seeking extradition. The Hindustan Times article went on to name all five Singhs. However, only two Singhs, Deepa Singh uh, of, of Sikh Youth UK and uh, Shamsha himself, uh, were made public. So clearly, the Hindustan Times had got the names of all five Singhs. Where could they possibly have gotten their names from? The names may have been released by the West Midlands police themselves. They weren't released in the public. It can only have come through collusion by West Midlands police and Indian authorities or Indian intelligence agencies. The UK police's role in surveilling and targeting Sikh activists uh, now Jawan organised to ban police presence and recruitment in Sikh spaces and Gurdwara, which was endorsed by UK uh, major Sikh organisations. Uh, this position would be vindicated in August 2022 when reprieve would point to the role of MI5 in the arrest of Jagtar Singh. This is a, an explosive paragraph. Firstly, uh, as a result of the earlier raids and, what, and the collusion, the known collusion between India and the British states and West Midlands police, that the, uh, the, uh, the backlash to that was that Sikh organisations said, no, OK, we're, we're, you know, we're going to take a step back from any collaboration with West Midlands police, with, with Brit the British state. The Gurdwara will likewise say, no, I'm sorry, we're not entertaining people like this if you are going to collude with our known enemies of India. And the revelation here, which I did not know, was that it turns out, and I'll cover this in my interview with, with Jackie's brother Gurpreet on Monday, MI5 and MI6, it turns out, sent intelligence to India that then subsequently led to the arrest and the arbitrary detention of Jagtar. Let that sink in. Our own intelligence services here in the UK passed intelligence on to India that allowed the detention of Jaggi, who has since been tortured. Now, the British government, the British state, has a very clear policy when it comes to torture, arbitrary detention. It will not entertain, it will not support in any way, shape or form any anti-democratic issues like this. It very publicly, there's no ambiguity about it. And yet we find British intelligence passed intelligence information 
to the Indian state, knowing full well what it would lead to. It would lead to the, the detention and torture of a British citizen. That is explosive in itself. Now, at the centre of all this was the organising capacity of Sick Youth UK. Following the raids in 2018, the UK government arrested and tried to extradite three Singhs from the West Midlands in December 2020. This is ultimately the, the West Midlands Three, as we refer to. Ultimately, the extradition was unsuccessful. The same discredited evidence in India, which resulted in these acquittals, um, was used and the UK government was willing to arrest and extradite three Singhs based solely on Indian intelligence in a legal case without basis that would eventually be dropped. Here we have more evidence of collusion between uh, Indian intelligence and the British state is that India, and we've had this in Canada, James, and of course in the UK, is where India is passing intelligence, Indi the uh, NIA and, and RAW are passing intelligence to, and colluding with the British state, saying here's some intelligence about some Khalistani activists, terrorists as they describe them, they're obliging the British state through basically very weak intelligence to go and arrest, harass, intimidate and detain uh, Khalistani activists here in the UK based on Indi Indian intelligence, even though it turns out to be false and the courts end up releasing these people. So the collusion of the UK establishment and the Indian state is well documented and it is long standing. Furtherance of a counter-terrorism agenda, it is designed to disrupt and discredit Sikh activism here in the UK. During the late 80s, a peak of Sikh militancy in the Punjab, a team from the West Midlands Police visited the Punjab to exchange information with security forces about Sikh, what they call terrorists, and their supporters. Yes, the late 1980s, after 1984, when we do know, uh, it, is, it has been leaked, that the British government was involved in Indira Gandhi's assault in, uh, on the Golden Temple, is that we do know that British military forces were consulted, particularly the SAS, were consulted about the attack on the Hamadir Sahib. We do know that the British Foreign Secretary at that time had discussions with Indira Gandhi and, uh, and his counterpart in India about that very assault. We do know that there was a lot of goings on. Dabinjit Singh um, himself, uh, a, a former guest, and, and will be a guest, I'm sure, in, in the near future to talk about similar things. We do know that there was collusion in 1984 about the Hamadir Saib attack. We do know now that later in the 80s, there was further collusion between the British state and the Indian state to try and suppress what they call meek, uh, Sikh militancy. In fact, it was just the Sikhs fighting back against, uh, against essentially a genocide. So I talk about a can of worms, James. Uh, where to begin with this? Uh, again, I, I've only touched the surface of what's been going on here. Shamsha's article is explosive in, in many ways. It, it, to the Sikh community, there's, there's, there's probably no, no revelations here. To those not in the Sikh community, it absolutely lifts the lid on a dreadful uh, collusion and collaboration between the British state and the Indian state against a community that are not terrorists, they are simply activists. They are political dissenters. They are political activists. They are fighting for the right to self-determination. There is no militancy there. There is no terrorism there. It is political activism. And yet, why is the British government, the formerly the Conservative government, and now the British Labour government, why are they still colluding and collaborating with the Indian state? It is a very big question. Why has uh, uh, Keir Starmer betrayed this promise given to the Sikh community to open an inquiry into 1984? I, I hear a deafening silence about that, Mr. Starmer. Why are you not opening this inquiry that you have promised you would uh, that you would push forward? That's a very big question. James, it's uh, this, as I say, this is a can of worms. And uh, wow, we, we don't have enough, uh, enough hours in the day to talk about this one. Oh, absolutely. And, and it's uh, worth noting as well that several British uh, parliamentarians and other uh, spokespeople have denied any knowledge of torture of Jay. And it's just out and out clear that, you know, that that's contrary to the reality of what's going on and for them to claim they didn't know ahead of time that this was a risk i mean that's just a pile of bullshit as well so yeah as i say uh do watch my interview with gurpreet on monday because of course we will be getting it straight from the horse's mouth what's been going on gurpreet has of course unsurprisingly been heavily involved 
from a political aspect into what's going on behind the scenes uh, with his brother. He's been campaigning for seven years to, to free Jaggy, uh, along with a, a very powerful group of supporters. So it will be uh, very interesting to hear his revelations. Um, of course, he's going to be restricted to some degree. He has to keep his language quite diplomatic. We don't, um, as, of course, many others of, of the community don't. We don't need to be diplomatic. We can be quite passionate and quite vocal about this because uh, I think the anger beneath the surface is enormous, as it is justifiably so. So anyway, let us uh, let us move on to the next story, because uh, so we'll, we'll talk about this further on Monday. Um, right. My next story is, uh, well, it's, it's yet another one. It's yet another um, moment. Of